This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Good evening and welcome to the Birch Aquarium at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. My name is Nigella Hilgarth and I'm the Executive Director. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the latest in the Jeffrey B. Graham series on Perspectives on Ocean Science. And it's a, my great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Steve Constable. Steve is a professor in the Geosciences Division here at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and he studied geology at the University of Western Australia and graduated with first class honors in 1979. And then in 1983, he received a PhD in geophysics from the Australian National University. And later that year, he moved to Scripps Institution of Oceanography uh, as a postdoc. And he's been here ever since. And he now holds a professorial position. And he's interested in all aspects of electrical conductivity. And he's made um, many contributions in different areas, including inverse theory, electrical properties of rocks, mantle conductivity, magnetic satellite induction studies, global lightning, and instrumentation. However, his main focus is marine electromagnetic methods. And I think that's something he's going to talk a lot about tonight. Just a, a few personal things about, about Steve. He um, has two children, and he keeps fish. And of course, I always like people to keep fish. Uh, but he's particularly interested in, um, in koi, I believe, and has some very large ones. Um, he's also married to uh, Kathy Constable, who um, many of you will have heard speak recently. And he refers to her as the smart geophysicist in the family. And I'm not going to go there. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Steve, who's going to talk about postponing the end of oil, the search for offshore energy resources. Thank you, Nigella, and thank you uh, all for uh, coming tonight. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about uh, the work that I've been doing since, uh, uh, pretty well since I arrived at Scripps on and off in trying to apply some technologies and science that have been developed at uh, Scripps to the uh, search for uh, oil and gas offshore. Um, I'm going to take a risk here. Some parts of this talk are going to be a little technical, but I, uh, I'm sure you can uh, manage it. And I'll uh, try and uh, lighten that up with some uh, pictures here and there between the equations. Um, so. <coughs> We're going to talk about uh, two basic techniques. And I'm going to be referring to these um, two techniques uh, on and off throughout the uh, talk. So this slide's sort of important. You need, to, you need to look at this slide before you go to sleep. We have um, two methods. One we will call the magnetotelluric method. Um, this involves putting um, instruments on the bottom of the ocean and leaving them there for several days to record natural variations in Earth's magnetic field and the electric fields that they, that induces in the rocks. And from this, we're able to um, look at the electrical conductivity of the seafloor and infer geological structure from, from, from that. Um, the other technique <coughs> involves, I'm calling that controlled source electromagnetic methods, or CSEM. That involves um, putting a man-made source of electromagnetic energy down close to the seafloor on the end of a cable towed from a ship. And these two methods are very complementary, um, but they, uh, they work well together because the same instruments that measure the magnetotelluric fields um, also measure the fields generated from the man-made transmitter that we use. So we use these techniques for um, mapping the seafloor geology through the um, electrical properties of rocks, which varies depending on the rock type. Um, and we've been using this to look at geology, but also for hydrocarbon exploration. And towards the end of the talk, I'll show you a few slides 
um, about a new technique that I've been uh, developing with uh, my colleagues here to uh, look at uh, gas hydrate um, in the seafloor. Um, and in the future, we're expecting to apply these techniques also to look, look for offshore water resources, which are going to become important in the future. So um, <clears throat> these methods, both of these methods, were developed at Scripps in the um, 1980s um, by Chip Cox and Jean Fieu, who started as uh, Chip's, Chip's student and stayed on at Scripps. Uh, and both, both of these uh, fine people are still, they're retired, but they're still, uh, they're still hanging around La Jolla and coming into work, especially, especially Chip. Uh, so these, these people are the pioneers. Uh, I came initially to Scripps to, to work with uh, Chip. Um, this first work was um, directed at understanding um, the geology of the seafloor, especially mid-ocean ridges, um, although some of the work was funded by DARPA. You may know what that stands for, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. This is this uh, blue sky uh, research funding from the uh, defense industry. They were interested in uh, looking at submarine communications, and they wanted to know what the electrical properties of the seafloor were um, for those reasons. Um, Life seemed a lot harder in those days. Um, the seafloor is a pretty uh, unforgiving environment, and we were trying to do things that people probably shouldn't have been trying to do, which involved measuring uh, small electric fields and at the same time putting large electric currents in on cables. Sometimes the cables did not behave. Um, the the, <clears throat> the seafloor pressures are absolutely huge. Um, an instrument like this might have a combined force on it um, in the region of three or four thousand tons. And we're, we were trying to build things that would uh, stand up to those pressures, but at the same time um, make the measurements that we wanted. Um, I have some props. The, uh, one of the, we scientists aren't uh, all uh, um, humorless, pointy-headed people. Um, one of the things that's uh, fun to do is to take polystyrene cups and put them down on the instruments and look at the, the pressure um, crush the cups. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, the law that says you can't dump plastics at sea means you won't find polystyrene cups on ships anymore, so you have to take your own. And if you're taking your own, then, then why, why stop at cups? Um, <laughs> so on the last cruise, uh, we... Uh, the, the chief scientist distributed a polystyrene head for every one of the scientists on board, which we, we decorated and put down on our instruments. So this, this, um, this, this one here has been down to about 4,500 meters, and uh, that's what happens. So, <laughs> so although the early work was challenging, um, this technology has been taken up recently over the last decade by uh, the oil industry. Um, since 2002, at least three contractors have been uh, uh, developed to offer um, Marine MT and CSEM as a commercial product to the oil industry. We've even had uh, several special purpose ships built, which is uh, um, pretty amazing because that's a big investment. Uh, and this is all based on technology developed at Scripps. Um, so, <clears throat> um, and if you, if you remember what these instruments look like, you'll, you'll see some more of the same later on when I show you what we've been uh, using. So, why, why should we be working with industry to look for oil at an institution that prides itself on climate change exhibits and uh, things like that? Well. Um, we don't really have much choice. Um, there's, <clears throat> you've probably all heard of peak oil. Um, that's the point at which oil production starts to decline. The, there's a lot of controversy about when this will happen. Some people think it already has. Some people think it will never happen. Um, to illustrate this, I'm showing here um, about 20 different scenarios for peak oil. Um, predicting the future, as uh, uh, somebody once said, is, uh, is not very easy. Um, there's another way of looking at this same problem. Um, we use about 30 gigabarrels, billion barrels of oil a year, and that usage is going up. Um, discoveries of new oil are about 10 
billion barrels a year and going down. Our current reserves are about 1,000 gigabarrels. <clears throat> so at these rates, we've got a 20 gigabarrel per year shortfall, which will consume the current reserves in about 50 years. So in 50 years, we won't have any oil. And that's the best case scenario. That's assuming that we can keep our appetite from rising and that we can continue to discover new um, oil fields. And so that's, we really ha have 50 years or less to convert a massive amount of infrastructure based on hydrocarbon energy for transportation and uh, um, air transport and car transport and so on and find something else. And nobody really knows what the something else is, yet alone have started re to replace the trillions of dollars worth of infrastructure that we've got invested in oil with something else. So we need all the time we can get to, to, to make this transition from the hydrocarbon energy economy to something, something else. And <clears throat> yet another way of looking at the story is to look at the price of oil. Um, it tells you uh, a lot about our dependence on hydrocarbons. Um, this is the price of oil since uh, before 1952, um, December last year. Um, it's an interesting plot. Even accounting for inflation, um, if I accounted for inflation, um, these levels here would be around $20 a barrel, and this peak here would be around $100 a barrel. But once you get into this last part of the curve, inflation doesn't much matter. Uh, as everybody keeps telling you, we haven't had much inflation yet, uh, lately. Um, oil prices have increased by almost a factor of 10 over the last decade. Um, it's anybody's guess. Again, predicting the future is hard, but if we keep this up, it's going to be $1,000 a barrel by 2020. Um, wars are a, clearly an important part of the story of the history of oil prices. Um, you can see that every time we uh, have a Middle East war, the price of oil goes up. Um, I have another perspective on the price of oil, um, and that's my activity um, <laughs> here. I moved to Scripps in uh, 1983 um, at a time when oil prices were, were pretty high, um, <clears throat> and that's when we got our first funding um, from the uh, oil industry. The, um, we had a consortium we put together in 1984 that was funded by uh, Elf, Aquitaine, Amoco, Arco, Sahio, and Texaco, and we started working on developing marine EM technologies for mapping offshore geology for the, for the oil industry. Um, it was a little ahead of its time. Deep water exploration in those days was about 300 meters. Um, and the technology that we adapted, we were using this technology in 4,000 meters of water in the deep ocean. And so um, it, it's a good technology for deep water it's not such a good technology for shallower water. But we, we started working on this. Um, <clears throat> around this point here, the, the oil price fell dramatically, um, and these companies promptly stopped funding our research. Um, but we had the last laugh. You'll notice that none of those companies exist anymore. <laughs> the current interest in the work we're doing at Scripps is not just due to the recent high oil prices. Um, our uh, current funding from the oil industry, which continues quite uh, nicely to today, started in the late 1990s, um, not so much because of the price of oil, but because exploration was moving from the, what I would call shallow water, to um, legitimately deep water. Um, so this, this was all um, based on developing the technology to explore for and produce oil from deep water. And uh, I wrote a recent review paper for one of the journals, and I collected some data um, on the number of producing oil wells in the Gulf of Mexico in water depths of more than 1,000 meters. And that's what this red line here is. Um, these are all deep water horizon type operations, and we're getting on for nearly 300 of them just in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this relies on various technologies, one of which is the development of the tension leg platform. These are floating 
platforms that are tethered to the seafloor, basically with the steel equivalent of long ropes. And these are the world's tallest man-made structures. This one here is Ursa, it's owned by Shell, um, and it's 1,306 meters high. It's not even the tallest one uh, that's in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so this interest in the deep water exploration did a couple of things for us. Um, it, made the dr it made drilling wells expensive. A typical deep water exploration well is hundreds of, hundred or more million dollars. A production well is getting on for a better part of a billion dollars. Um, and so the industry is more interested in spending money to mitigate risks from failed, failed wells. And again, the technology we were using was, was applicable to uh, the deep water. The time horizon for the deep water exploration is, is, is about 10 years from discovery to production. So again, the industry has a longer view than some people like politicians and even the National Science Foundation. Now for something completely different, some science. Um, how can we use marine EM techniques to help find oil? Well, this is a slide that everybody in my field loves to show. This is a, a, a totally fictional picture of the um, solar wind, the stream of charged, high energy charged particles that comes out of the sun and hits the Earth's magnetic field all the time. Um, and it's, fortunately for us, it's deflected by the magnetic field. And Kathy told you all about this um, last year when she gave her perspectives talk. When we get a large, what we call a coronal mass ejection from the sun, we can get a thing called a magnetic storm on Earth, which produces a change in the Earth's magnetic field that we see at the surface of the Earth, of as much as 1% of the Earth's main field. Um, but they don't happen all the time. So we use um, much more reliable, smaller field variations for our studies. So this is a picture of 2,000 seconds um, a recording of the uh, magnetic field in the north-south direction on the seafloor. And you see these lovely uh, little um, wiggles in the field created by the solar wind and the charged particles that it injects into the Earth's magnetosphere. Um, and we, we make those measurements and, and we're going to use them. They're very small though. Um, and they're not anything close to 1% of the Earth's field. Um, they're more like a hundred millionth of the main field. Um, we measure them in picoteslas, which is 10 to the minus 12 teslas. The Earth's field is 30 to 60 microteslas. And these changes in the Earth's magnetic field induce electric currents in the Earth, which we can actually see. So here's a measurement of the electric field, and with um, the eye of faith, you can see that the wiggles in the magnetic field are mirrored in the signals in the electric field. So the electric field in the Earth has been induced by these variations in the magnetic field. And we use that to study the electrical conductivity. So how do we do that? Well, um, I'm going to talk you through Maxwell's equations. Hold on to your seats now. The, <clears throat> both the magnetotelluric method, which uses the natural fields of the Earth's um, time varying field, and the controlled source method where we put a man-made source of magnetic energy that varies according to our specifications near the seafloor. Both produce a time-varying magnetic field. So here we are. This is our time-varying primary magnetic field. Um, Faraday's law says that um, a time-varying magnetic field will induce an electric field. This is the dynamo effect. Anybody that's used a dynamo or a generator or an alter alternator has benefited from, from this. So in, in the equation, this is physics speak for a um, variation in time variation in the magnetic flux. And it says that it produces a circulating electric field. But I've drawn that here for you. There's, an, there's the electric field generated by the changes in the magnetic field. Ohm's law, which is a sort of the um, extension of uh, the V equals IR you might have uh, come across in uh, high school, says that an electric current density J will be, in, will be uh, uh, generated from this electric field if the Earth has a conductivity, which I've put here as sigma. Um, so the electric field is generated by the moving magnetic field 
and it induces, it, it pushes um, an electric current through the rocks. Ampere's law says that this current will produce a secondary magnetic effect. So this is a, an electromagnet inside the Earth, and it produces this circulating current is producing a secondary magnetic field. Um, now if we go back to the Faraday's law, there's a minus sign in here. This minus sign means that the secondary magnetic field opposes the changes in the primary magnetic field. So the bottom line here is that the electrically conductive rocks absorb variations in the EM fields much more than the resistive rocks. So we can look at the ratio of these electric and magnetic fields and work out how conductive the rock is. For magnetotelluric methods, um, this means that the more resistive the rock, the bigger these electric fields that we measure will be. Now before I just showed you two curves, now I've got four. This is because we can measure these fields in two directions, in the north-south direction and the east-west direction. The next step is to take these data that we measure on the seafloor and convert them into these ratios of electric to magnetic fields and, can, uh, and turn them into um, an, a, a, a resistivity measurement. And we do this, when we do this, we also convert from time to period or frequency because we exploit the fact that the, uh, the, the lower frequency energy penetrates more deeply into the Earth. Well, we, also can create, we can also compute a phase difference between the electric and magnetic fields. Next step um, is actually a complicated procedure. Nigella mentioned that I'd made contributions to inversion. Well, that's what this means. Um, we can take um, many of these data sets spread across the seafloor, and through this complicated process called inversion, we can turn them into a picture of the electrical conductivity inside the Earth. Um, and then we can interpret that conductivity in terms of rock type. So this, in this case, blue is resistive. Um, blue is, uh, happens to be a salt body in the Gulf of Mexico. And so this little bump in the data is caused by this body of salt. And then this little, this rise in the data here is associated with the basement rocks. These are sediments, these are deep, deep rocks that are igneous rocks, less, less porous, they have less water in them. So there we are, there's the science. The current collaboration with the oil industry started with a need to study these salt bodies in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the oil exploration business uses the seismic method for almost everything because it's a really nice method and it produces these lovely high definition pictures of the sedimentary structure in the seafloor rocks from which you can uh, interpret the geology and, and look for oil. So this is, this is the top of a, every one of these vertical features in the seismic section is, the, is, is, is caused by a salt body. These might, be, these, these might be quite thin, but they reflect all the seismic energy and um, you, can't, you, you can see for yourself, you can't see what's underneath them. So knowing where the bottom of this salt body is, is, is a big problem. And it's something that we can address by um, these sorts of pictures where we actually can, we have a much fuzzier image, but we can see the bottom of the, of the salt. So we worked on developing the instruments to do this. Um, we developed some uh, magnetometer sensors that could measure these very small fields and we packaged them together with um, electric field sensors. We, uh, we put electrodes in the ends of these plastic arms and measure the electric field across these uh, using one of these seafloor instruments, many of these seafloor instruments. Um, so here's a picture from Kerry Key's PhD thesis. Uh, um, Kerry was a student back in the 1990s who was working with me on developing these techniques. And we've overlaid the seismics on the um, the conductivity 
So this, this, is, this is a sort of a sl two slices through a salt body in the Gulf of Mexico. It's called Gemini. It was the first salt body under which they actually found hydrocarbons. There was a gas, there's a gas field underneath this, and this was the first gas field found under a salt body in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so we were told the bottom of the salt body was down here, but you can see that there's actually an overhang here that shows up quite nicely in the electrical conductivity image. And once you see that, you can see that there's a seismic reflection here, probably from the bottom of this. So we're, we're adding information. We're adding quite important information because the seismologists can reprocess their data if they know how thick this salt is and do a better job of looking at the structures underneath. So that was the first part of it. The second part started in the turn of the century when Statoil, the Norwegian government uh, oil company and ExxonMobil, who you've probably all heard of, um, both approached Scripps to help develop uh, methods for sensing these hydrocarbon reservoirs directly. So not just looking at the geology, but looking for the oil and gas. Um, and the problem they were trying to solve here was, again, the seismic method is a beautiful method, um, but uh, it's used to look for bright reflections from the top of oil and gas fields. Um, but these, um, these reflections can produce false positives for the following reason. Um, a, a small amount of gas bubbles in the water that saturates these sediments um, produces a large change in the seismic properties. So if you think of a, a bottle of um, soda water with a few bubbles in it, those few bubbles can, can change the seismic properties an awful lot, even though the bottle is mostly water. So um, I've, I've, I've done two calculations here. Um, I've, take, I've taken a rock with a certain amount of water. This is just a, a calculation, but this is how it works in real rocks. And I've, I've, I've slowly filled the pore space with gas from nothing to all the pore space filled with gas. So this is a gas reservoir, and this is this thing called fizz gas that everybody worries about uh, drilling into. And the, the, the green line is seismic velocity. And you can see that the first 5 percent of the, uh, uh, 5 or 10 percent of the gas produces a huge drop in seismic velocity. So the, so the seismologists see any small amount of gas in the rock. Um, on the other hand, the electrical resistivity doesn't start to change until about three quarters of the uh, rock is uh, full of gas. And these are, these are economical oil and gas reservoirs. Uh, these are not. Um, so we have, a, um, we have a technique for um, telling whether these um, seismic targets are really um, oil and gas reservoirs or, or not. And since it's going to cost them about hundred or two hundred million dollars to find out by drilling a hole, it, it's, it's, it's good to know. Um, Magnetotelurics isn't going to work for this. These oil and gas reservoirs are too thin to uh, sense with uh, magnetotelluric method. We need our man-made source of energy. So in this movie, we have a, um, an EM transmitter just here on the seafloor, um, and it's producing um, a oscillating electric current in the seawater. Uh, we use about 500 amps for this. The oil industry uses nearly 1,000 amps. Um, because I told you that the energy propagates better on the resistive rocks, you can see that the, en the energy is propagating through the seafloor much better than it's propagating through the seawater. Um, and so this is nice because it means if we're sitting out here uh, making a measurement, what we're measuring is mostly the resistivity of the seafloor rocks and not so much the resistivity of the seawater, which we, we don't care about. We know what the seawater resistivity is. It's about 0.30 ohmmeters, and we can measure it just by dipping an instrument into the seawater. Um, if we put an oil reservoir in here, so now I put a thin resistive layer. It's, it's really very thin. But you can, you can see in this movie, this simulation of the fields, you can see how the energy is propagating very rapidly through this layer and, 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 and emanating from this layer up to the seafloor. 
So here's our transmitter, and here's our seafloor electric and magnetic field receiver, and it's measuring energy that's, that's interacted with this oil and gas layer and is, is, is diffusing up to the seafloor where we can measure it. So that's the principle of how we, how we can use this uh, technique. The electric fields are going to be bigger when I put this layer in. So we first did this in November 2000, um, funded by Statoil, and we were collaborating with the University of Southampton. Um, when we, went, uh, we were going to go to a place off Norway, which hadn't been drilled. And it was a beautiful seismic hydrocarbon indicator, and they were so convinced that they were going to succeed in finding a big oil reservoir that we, we made plans to go out and make our measurements immediately after they drilled the hole. Um, and they drilled the hole, this was off Greenland, and um, it was actually reported in the paper it was such a spectacular failure. Um, they, they, they did not find oil and gas, they found fizz gas. So we had to relocate our plans and go down offshore Angola, which was a lot more fun. It was warmer and we got to go to Tenerife. Um, so this, is, this oil field is called uh, Girasol. It's in development now. It's a huge oil field. Um, they've actually developed it by, instead of putting one of these tension leg platforms, they have a big production vessel permanently um, sitting on site and then they'll, they'll bring transport vessels up to this periodically to take the oil back. Um, it's, it's several hundred kilometers offshore. So there's a picture of the reservoir and, and I'm going to show you the results from an instrument sitting on the south end on the edge of the reservoir. This is, this is our instrument sitting on the seafloor. And these are measurements of the electric field as we tow the transmitter over this instrument. Now, if you look at these numbers here, they're very, very small. T this is 10 to the minus 14 volts per meter per transmitter source dipole moment, we call it. We're measuring less than a nanovolt uh, per meter here, um, very sensitive measurements. Um, the, um, the f we, if you do the calculation, that, to, to, to work out what you'd see without the reservoir, this is this uh, um, mud-colored line here. I've, I've made it mud because we just assume there's nothing but mud. Um, um, if you put a reservoir that goes all the way across, you get this pink line here, which agrees over here, but not over here. And if you, put a, if you model a reservoir that terminates at this edge where it should terminate, you get a prediction that falls right on top of the, the data we collected. So um, this was considered to be a success. Um, you can see that these electric fields are 10 times bigger than they would be without the oil, because this was a big oil field. We didn't, this was the first time we did this. We didn't want to make any mistakes. Um, within about a year, we were out there again doing exactly the same thing for ExxonMobil. Same team, University of Southampton and uh, Scripps, um, but uh, this time a different oil company. Um, they were getting a little more sophisticated by now. Um, they worked on two prospects. The first prospect up here um, was a known oil field. Um, and so they, they made a calculation as to what they expected to see for the oil field and then what they would expect to see if the oil field wasn't there. And we collected data and you can see that it, it, it follows the prediction quite nicely. But that's not good enough for ExxonMobil managers. They're a pretty hard-nosed company. They, uh, um, we already knew the oil field was there, so, you know, so what? Um, this is more interesting. We, we, we collected data over this um, field before they drilled it. Um, there were two there were thought to be two reservoirs. Um, so the red line is the prediction for both reservoirs full of oil. Um, the green line is a prediction for one reservoir filled with oil. And the light blue line is the prediction for no oil at all. And we collected the data. And it doesn't uh, take a lot of uh, imagination to see that um, we are predicting a dry hole. And they drilled. Um, a well, it would probably cost them about $100 million, and it was dry. 
Um, so as my colleague from Exxon says, this was a, uh, uh, a success for geophysics, but a failure for exploration. Um, so the idea here is to build up enough confidence that you can make this measurement and walk away without drilling a hole. Um, and you know, that's not easy. Um, and you don't make money from not finding oil, but you can save a lot of money if you, if you uh, know the difference. Um, so we were working with Southampton University because the transmitter that Chip built at Scripps was um, long since out of commission. Um, and uh, my colleagues in Southampton had uh, built, up an e built up an EM group uh, um, largely modeled on the uh, Scripps technology. Um, but now we were uh, well funded um, and we could build our own new transmitter. Um, we call her Susie, Scripps Undersea Electromagnetic Source Instrument. Um, this is Susie. Uh, we discovered that you needed the smile to make it work properly. <laughs> we actually have two of these now because it's always nice to have a spare. Um, and about a year and a half ago, um, we were funded by um, the Australian um, resources company, BHP Billiton, to um, collect our own data over a gas field off Western Australia. Um, I got my, as Nigella said, I got my um, undergraduate degree down, down here in Perth, so this was fun to go back and take one of our best vessels uh, out of Fremantle Harbour. Um, this is a big gas field. It's uh, coincidentally half owned by ExxonMobil as well as uh, BHP. Um, and we collected a, a rather large, very, very nice data set. And uh, I have a student, David Meyer, who's working on uh, this data set uh, still. Um, so here, now we're making uh, measurements of magnetic field as well as electric field. The data quality is much nicer than we uh, saw in that first uh, study. Um, and so here's a site that's well off the gas field in blue and a site that's on the edge of the gas field in green. And you can see that the electric fields are um, higher over the gas field um, than they are off the gas field, as advertised. Um, we're not looking at an order of magnitude now. We're looking at about a factor of two. But these are the data quality is uh, sufficiently high that that's pretty, pretty clear in the data. Um, that was just one site, one frequency. It's actually a, a big data set, as I say. Um, here are six different frequencies for all the sites along this line. Um, and we're basically showing the relative size of the electric fields, where red is big. Um, and this is the gas field, showing up quite nicely in the data, uh, except at the lowest frequency. So this is why we uh, collect a lot of frequencies. We predicted that this lowest frequency wouldn't see the gas field from our modeling before the uh, survey, but uh, we collected the data um, just to demonstrate that. So we're still working on using this data set to develop new analysis tools, and uh, um, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and we'll be working on that until, until David graduates next year. Um, I'm going to finish up by talking about another application um, of EM methods that um, another ex-student and I have been working on, and that is gas hydrate. Um, this is related to oil exploration in a number of ways. Um, so we're still partly funded by the oil industry to do this. Um, gas hydrate is this really strange thing. It's, it's frozen water that's mixed with methane, um, which is natural gas. Um, so it forms these cages of water with a methane molecule sitting, sitting in the middle of them. Um, and so it, it looks like ice, but it, it, when it starts to warm up and give off methane, it, it burns. So, so you, people love to show these pictures of um, burning gas hydrate. But if you just spend a lot of money trying to get this back from the seafloor, you're horrified to see people burn it. Um, <laughs> It, it forms under high pressures and cold temperatures. So it, it forms in the deeper parts of the ocean, deeper than typically 1,000 meters deep, um, where the water's fairly cold, but the pressure's high. 
Um, when you go inside the Earth, the Earth gets hotter. It's called the geothermal gradient, and uh, you, you, for about every kilometer you go down, the temperature rises about 20 degrees Celsius. Um, and so what happens is you get to a point where it gets too hot in the seafloor for the gas hydrate to be stable. So you get hi gas hydrate is stable in this layer, few hundred meters thick, close to the uh, seafloor in the deep ocean. Um, it's viewed by some countries, including the US, but especially Canada and Japan that don't have, or well, Japan particularly doesn't have conventional oil reserves. It's, it's, it's viewed as an energy resource. Uh, it's sort of viewed as a clean energy resource because methane, natural gas, is uh, lower carbon content than coal and or oil, so it, it produces less greenhouse gas for a given amount of energy. Um, it's been implement, implicated in rapid climate change in the past. If you release, methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. Um, if you release it rapidly from the seafloor, you can, in theory, uh, change the global temperatures. It's a drilling hazard. If you dr drill through this stuff, and then you start pumping warm oil from deep down, and, the th and it melts around your wellhead, uh, you can have a real problem. Um, it also plays a role in seafloor stability. If we start warming up the ocean um, and changing the uh, ocean uh, depth with climate change, this stuff can, if this stuff starts to dissociate, we can get landslides offshore, which can create tsunamis. So for all sorts of reasons, we really want to know about this stuff, yet we don't know much about it in terms of its uh, distribution and quantity. Um, it's because, again, it's difficult to map with seismics. Um, <coughs> The same story, um, at the bottom of this stability field where you get hydrate above and free gas below, you can get a small amount of gas in the sediment trapped at the freezing point, um, which produces a lovely seismic reflector, which is called the bottom simulating uh, reflector, um, which doesn't have anything to do with how much hydrate is actually in the, in the seafloor section. So partly because of this, um, we don't know how much hydrate is out there by orders of magnitude, factors of 10. Um, most estimates um, suggest that there's more methane in hydrate than there is in conventional gas reserves, but we don't know. So um, Karen Weitemeyer, Scripps, and I have been working on developing the technologies that we've been using for oil exploration um, and apply them to um, looking for gas hydrate. So, the first example is from Hydrate Ridge. This was one of, one of our research vessels, uh, the New Horizon, was driving up to Newport, Oregon for another project. And so we were able to get a couple of days of ship time to try an idea. It wasn't really funded by anybody. Um, and so we put out 25 seafloor instruments and towed our transmitter along them and collected some controlled source EM data. And then with um, some collaboration with industry, we, we did this inversion uh, to create this picture. Um, here's, this is overlaid on seismics again, and this is the BSR that I was talking about, the bottom simulating reflector. You see how it follows the bottom? Um, that's showing the edge of the hydrate stability field, but, but not much else. Um, we know there's hydrate on the seafloor. This is called hydrate ridge, after all. It's sitting on the seafloor up here um, because there's gas being drawn up to the top by this um, Horizon A, it's a very permeable rock that's bringing gas up to the surface. Um, so we interpret these resistors here below the BSR as free gas. But out here, um, this is probably where all the hydrate is. So though this is where it sits on the seafloor and this is where they drilled trying to find it, it's probably mostly out here. So this is, so this is perhaps a useful technique for finding out how much of the stuff's out there and where it is. So based on that result, we were able to get some funding um, from the Department of Energy and the oil industry um, and develop some technology that's uh, um, geared towards um, looking for hydrate. Um, so we don't have to look as deep as we do for oil and gas. So we, we, we developed this thing we call Vulcan. It's, a, it's an electric field measuring device that we tow behind the transmitter. So this means we don't have to litter the seafloor with these instruments, which take time to put down, they take time to pick up. Um, we can just tow these, these guys 
around uh, continuously to, um, to look for hydrate in the seafloor. So there's a picture of Susie without the smile. It didn't work. That's why we had to put the smile on it. Um, and Vulcan. Okay, so um, in 2008, we uh, took the Roger Ravel from um, Miami to Tampa through four places in the Gulf of Mexico where hydrate is thought to be on the seafloor. I'm going to show you results from just one. Mississippi Canyon. Um, nobody had heard of Mississippi Canyon until recently, um, but everybody knows now the, uh, the, um, the uh, Deepwater Horizon problem was very close to this site here. Um, so again, there's hydrate sitting on the seafloor, but nobody knows about hydrate at depth. Um, and in this area here, there are actually these um, craters on the seafloor that are thought to be associated with gas coming out of the seafloor. Um, some of this gas did form hydrate on the seafloor. So we towed across this area um, backwards and forwards with Vulcan. These are results from Vulcan. We put seafloor instruments down too, but I'm not going to show you those results. Um, this is the new technology. And most of it is uniform conductive seafloor except for just just here, around this southeast crater complex, uh, where we're seeing these resistive features. This is this line here overlaid on the uh, seismic chirp. So this is high frequency seismic data looking for hydrate. Um, we, we see resistors in some places where the um, get strong uh, seismic reflections. Some places where we get seismic reflections, we don't see the resistor. Uh, we think this is a different sort of rock that's reflecting the seismics but not uh, forming a, a resistor. So we think that's a, a confounding problem and this is good because we're, sh we're pretty sure this is, this is where the hydrate is. Um, so we're still, again, still working on these data sets um, and, uh, and, and sort of having fun with those. Um, so with that, um, I'd first of all we have a, a fairly nice website, so if anything I've said um, sounds at all interesting, um, mariniemlab.ucsd.edu has got lots of pictures and cruise reports, uh, pictures of all the shrunken heads we collected on that cruise. Um, that was from the last cruise, uh, Serpent, which was off Nicaragua uh, middle of last year. Um, I'd like a lot of people helped with this work over the years. I'd like to thank all the colleagues and students and lab people and sponsors and ships that have been used to collect the data sets that I've been showing you. And I guess the last thing I'd like to say is when Chip Cox and Jean Fiu were developing these methods 35 years ago to look for mid-ocean ridges and the electrical conductivity of deep sea floor, um, it was impossible to predict that it would be worth hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to the oil industry. Um, so I think this is a good example of how um, what we call blue water research, pure research, um, eventually became useful to society. And in these very difficult times of uh, cutting budgets, bad economy, um, I think it's worth remembering that uh, um, sometimes you have to wait 30 years to find out that your science was uh, going to be uh, uh, economically viable. Um, I think this is a good example of that. So thank you for coming. I hope you've enjoyed yourselves and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Okay, so the question is how does this compare to the other uh, methods the oil industry uses? Um, well, I've shown, you the I've shown you comparisons with seismic. Seismic is the top method. Um, for technical reasons I don't want to go into, they, they, they intrinsically have a much better res resolution than we, we have. They, they can see um, features that are only a few meters in size, and we see um, a fuzzier image of the seafloor. Um, but we're, we're measuring a different property, and that's what makes it valuable. They, they're measuring acoustic velocities and we're measuring electrical resistivity and in some cases that is much more highly correlated with what they're interested in, which is oil and gas, um, than the seismic properties. 
Um, the other techniques they use are gravity and magnetics. Uh, we call those the potential field methods. They're also useful, but they're, uh, and they're also a lot cheaper. Um, but they have even lower resolution than we do. Uh, we have an intrinsic, um, because of this, because we can use different frequencies to look at different depths, we have an intrinsic depth sensitivity. Uh, gravity and magnetics um, have very, very, very poor depth sensitivity. In fact, with gravity, you can model any surface gravity data set simply with a, a, th a thin layer of variable density at the surface. So, um, so we're, sitting, we're sitting somewhere in between seismics and gravity and magnetics. What are, what are the, the question was, what do they use as a source for the acoustic signal? Well, this talks all about electromagnetics. Um, but um, they would typically use an air gun. The, uh, they, they compress gas into a cylinder, and then they release it very rapidly to form this little gas explosion near the ship. Um, has any of this exploration done in, been done in the Arctic? Um, the oil industry have used this technique um, in uh, off Norway and the Barents Sea. Um, we have a proposal pending right now with the National Science Foundation to use the techniques we developed for hydrate um, for mapping permafrost. And in particular, mapping um, how the edge of the permafrost is retreating uh, as a consequence of climate change. So we're, we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed that we'll, we'll get funding to do that. There's a question at the back there. So the question is, have we been using the method long enough to know whether we're having an impact on global estimates, estimates of global oil reserves? Well, I think the easy answer to that is no. Um, it, there, there are maybe, there's maybe a ship operating at any one time using this technique. Um, so you know we're we're only covering a fraction of the globe compared with the uh, seismologists at this point. Um, this technique is being used to solve uh, special problems rather than to blanket the uh, globe. Maybe one day. Right. The question is, uh, how is it that a resistive oil lake um, is a better uh, propagator of electromagnetic energy? Um, well, that's that was sort of the the attempt to explain the. Um, induction and Maxwell's equations, that it's counterintuitive because you're, we're thinking of, uh, we often think in terms of copper wires and DC, essentially low frequency current being carried by uh, conductive wires. Um, but this is actually not um, DC current. These are variations we typically would use about one hertz fields. Um, and that becomes, um, um, electromagnetic energy with a frequency. Um, and then those changing magnetic fields will induce the secondary fields, which in a conductor will make them disappear. But in a resistor, they can uh, travel a long way. So for example, um, another form of electromagnetic energy is light. The light travels through um, insulators, such as glass and air and the vacuum of space. And then when it hits a sheet of copper, it's absorbed straight away. Um, so it's the same principle as, as, as that. So the, the answer is it's not, it's not DC current. It's actually electromagnetic energy, uh, although it's actually we operate at frequencies that some people in the radio frequency call, you know, call extra ULF, very low frequency. We, when, the, when this energy goes into the air, it actually behaves like light, but not when it's in the rocks. Is there something down here? I don't think so. Um, I think our resolution's way too small for that. Certainly not the techniques we're using here. Um, people often ask me whether it hurts the fish, and the answer is no. <laughs> well, Steve, I want to thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. It's a great talk.